I don't know the if there's obviously belief shapes uh, behavior, mm-hmm. and so a lot of the reason as to why a lot of uh, like I, I get the the type of people who are just like like on every religious post are just like oh gosh you guys are stupid or whatever like I get it yeah. because like. There's a certain extent to where a belief in God extends to a, an acceptance of certain other values. Mm-hmm. Um, values such as um, blind faith, mm-hmm. uh, although all true faith is blind. Right. Um, that like accepting truth without evidence is in- really dangerous. Uh <laughs> So, I mean, I'm that way just in my head because I like having friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be hard to live here for very long if you really wanted to get uh, like, yeah. in conflict with people about that. I just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just think that it doesn't, like, if there is a God out there somewhere and he really is, like, who people say he is like in my experience, there hasn't been much evidence of him like reaching out to try exactly. to change my life. Yeah. So if he is out there, then it doesn't really, he's not like a part of my life. So it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. And if he's not out there, uh, then he's not really a part of my life because he doesn't exist. So yeah. <laughs> either way, my life is unchanged. Yeah. And, um, if other people believe that their life has changed based on the belief that there is someone out there, wanting to talk to them mm-hmm. or wanting to be a part of their life then 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 they can do that um but yeah i just yeah yeah not for me but i mean like that that's sort of the problem in sort of not acknowledging the initial uh well just simple notion of a god then you're still also allowing for the potential other problems that come with um maybe putting incorrect reasoning behind certain, uh, conclusions. Um, so I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's hard. Be- and again, I don't engage, right. but like, yeah, I will say that, but I think that that's in that case, like the enemy isn't. And I do think that like one definitely correlates with the other, but I don't necessarily think that it's a causation that, I think that the belief in God isn't the problem. The belief in like dogma, like this like blind faith in this tradition and Mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong is based on like what your grandfather believed Mm -hmm. is right and wrong. Like if, if morality isn't changing and evolving as cultures do and as your interactions with people every day do, I think that like the more you interact with people and the more you kind of shape this you that is ever changing. Um, so I think this like inability to change and this like steadfast, like belief in no, like you're wrong and I won't change and you won't change. So like, I'm going to fight you or whatever. Like that's (laughs) what starts wars. And, and that's a, that's a dogma thing. Like, yeah. So, but I do understand that like without God, so far, a lot of the dogma that we know is because of a belief in God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but I, I think that the dogma is the real enemy. And um, I think that empathy and this kind of like realizing that everybody has a personal experience and that that changes things and makes things more complicated. Like, yeah, yeah. The, that that's kind of like the way of remedying things, um, kind of fixing dogma. Yeah. And and it's not that like I I don't consider people's experiences or whatever. It's just that like No, I understand. <laughs> it's uh, just when people are yelling on the internet about things that are obviously like really racist or sexist or something based mm-hmm. on the teaching of or what they believe to be the teaching of something which exactly. is actually just the social connotation of something like, like I said before, like, I don't necessarily think that like 
Christianity is wrong, but I do, like, disagree with the connotation of, like, American Christianity and what it means to Mm -hmm. be a Christian in America for the most part. Yeah. Like, I'm not attacking, like, all Christians in America, but there's definitely, like, this more often than not, like, all abortion is wrong all Mm -hmm. the time and, like, racist undertones and... Yeah. And... With it. A lot of what I I try to do and even through conversations that I have on this podcast is that like I expect that if you're going to have an argument or a rule or something is that it has to be consistent throughout or else Mm -hmm. you're just being a hypocrite. And so if you are going to say that, you know, abortion is wrong because killing is wrong, then that has to extend to all other, all other examples of killing. And so you can't say well in this instance like is killing okay. yeah like yeah. killing is justified but in this instance it isn't and yeah. based on the severity of how adorable the thing is that you're killing then you know that's whenever we just well that's just an inconsistent argument you know well or at and, least it, a lot and it's interesting down. to like bring that into like a political like a political realm where um you realize just how much this kind of like Christian dogma has affected conservative politics and how, like, but at the same time, like, that double standard is present that, you know, abortion is wrong and the act of, quote, killing a, a quote, infant or whatever is wrong. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like, they're going to cut funding to, like, all of these, like, orphanages. Yeah, and exactly. Cut funding to, like, social, like, the some of the, like, driving, like, socialist kind of thoughts that give money to some of these like less fortunate people Mm -hmm. that are more in line with a lot of their Mm -hmm. teachings and beliefs like why is that okay to like cut education and and all these things so in a lot of ways they're pro-birth but not necessarily pro-life and i've heard that argument and i kind of agree with it well, there's also an extent to which uh, the point that you make that, like, sort of dogma is the enemy, that, like, they're not even following the dogma of their religion. They're just following the dogma of conservatism, yeah. or at least with mm-hmm. the whatever the hell conservatism is now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, especially given that, like... I don't even know what it is anymore right now. And especially since the political spectrum has just like, yeah, they've turned around on each other. Yeah. It's weird. Um, I don't really, I'm not smart enough to really like understand. <laughs> I listen to a lot of people that are way smarter than me about their opinions about it. And they're all stumped too. So <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what to say. Cause I mean, um, cause I have these views that will, you know, obviously be construed as like, oh, you're just like a dumb progressive liberal or whatever. But then I also have these other views that are kind of like, man, that's very unprogressive. For one, I I think that, um, I don't know your stance on it, but it could could be a good uh, train of thought that we could follow is that like, I find it very difficult for a society to accept that some people must now be called Z instead of Um, he or she. Yeah. And that is going to be very challenging if we move forward with that. Or if we reject that, then we have to accept that it is reasonable to reject that. Uh, I, I have a couple of like, uh, trans friends and acquaintances and Mm -hmm. um my stance on it is you know whatever they want me to call them i'll call them what they want sure and uh i i don't think that it's unreasonable for society to have to kind of change the way that they've been doing things in order to protect people's feelings and to respect people and i think Mm -hmm. uh, that if that means they want to be called z instead of him or her or, or whatever, then, and that's fine. I, I, I think that some people get kind of sensitive about it and I think that that sensitivity is justified, but at the same time, like me being as non-confrontational as I am, I feel like if I was in a similar situation, I would just kind of smile and nod and never talk to them again. Like, <laughs> so 
I think in, in, in a large part, like, yeah, I think that it should be okay to kind of, like, put that kind of imposition on society to change every once in a while based mm. on identity. And I think that well, identity is really changing at this point in, in our lives, be it through this, like, conversation about this kind of transgender idea it's like a new thing in society it's not necessarily a new thing but yeah um you know it's becoming like more and more aware of in society and and that's changing culture and um just everything is changing with technology and things uh i don't think it's too big of an imposition to have people be called what they want to be called well yeah um i don't think that's as much of a problem because i mean yeah, people have been getting sex changes or whatever for uh, for a long time. It, it's more so the uh, the threat of um, someone losing their job uh, for not following those things, which is uh, dangerous regarding freedom of speech. Oh, uh, okay. Um. That uh, that I don't have a problem because I I do have a friend that uh, would like to be referred to as they, and uh, while it is difficult for me to like switch that, mm -hmm. you know I yeah. I respect them and so I will refer to them as they, and so because I and which would extend to anyone else who I know that would prefer to be called Z or whatever. It's just that um, if someone maybe accidentally does so or just continues to forget or something is that in certain universities they are uh, – like it's some law in Canada now that like um, people can lose their jobs over it. Yeah, I don't think that that's a role of the government to decide those kinds of things. I think that – it's more of a role of the individual in society and I feel like uh, more specifically in reference to you and your friend and you know, like if you forget to call them they they realize that you like accept them mm -hmm. so they're not necessarily going to like hate you for it or want you to be fired or something yeah. it's not like it's not necessarily as charged of a term especially in this transition period uh, between, like, of society where we're not necessarily, like, as acquainted uh, with that, the idea of that mm -hmm. being a thing that happens. Um, I think that it's, it's just as much as it's society's role to, like, accept them and refer to them as they want to be referred to. It's their society, it's their kind of role individually to understand that there are people that do mean well and want to support them but are due to like certain habits that they've grown up with or or what have you certain factors that or just the fact that they had never yeah. referred to a person as they right before. and that's a new thing like that they need to be patient uh and that's easy for me to say to, to <laughs> tell them to be patient but i yeah, think yeah. that it's kind of like a, a something that you kind of have to do it kind mm. of comes with the fact of going public with with that kind of thing um you have to be patient with other people accepting that kind of a that kind of a change yeah even in your own family mm -hmm. and and things like that um but obviously that's coming from you know a white <laughs> straight male so yeah take that with a grain of salt um and I guess, like, technology has a lot to do with that now, too, because you're now able to sort of um, put yourself out there in a way that, like, you can't just wear, like, a name badge that says, call me he. Um, I mean your badge is sort of how you present yourself mm -hmm. to the world. Um, but now through, because the, the same friend, um, that asked to be called they 
uh, the way they did it was on Facebook and it was mm -hmm. like, Hey, I'm gender fluid and I would prefer it if you call me they, but if you don't, that's totally cool, which is totally the right approach right, yeah. <laughs> of doing it. Um, but it, it, it makes like Facebook makes it possible for them to do that and makes it possible for us to, uh, actually wear a name badge in our uh technology body <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it's complicated Just, identity is this weird thing now um basically like facebook and instagram and social media is like our critique of ourselves that we like present to the world like this is the me that i want mm -hmm. everyone to see and mm -hmm. then but at the same side there's this flip side to that that like forums and and random reddit stuff that mm -hmm. you you're just a handle you know mm -hmm. you don't have a identity yeah. like you're anonymous and you yeah. can say whatever you want and you can be <laughs> as mean as you want or yeah. whatever and nobody you have no ramifications for saying mm -hmm. whatever comes in your head and so there's kind of this like one side that's like this extreme fake like side of yourself that you want of who you want to be in reference to like everybody seeing you and judging you and then mm -hmm. there's this other side that's kind of like the antithesis of that that but it almost becomes like more charged in some ways because it's fueled by this like anonymous yes yeah. yeah so i mean let's talk about authenticity for a second um cuz even for in, in a lot of ways, our society values authenticity, like, really highly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, whenever Mariah Carey uh, puts down the microphone and mm -hmm. it, the speakers are still singing, like, even though everyone knows that she probably is lip syncing anyways, like, no, she, like, took away the veil. Yeah. Like... Uh, yeah. And that's not my words. That's uh, my teacher's words. Uh, who who pointed that? Uh, Patrick Conlon. Yeah, the uh, suspension of disbelief. Yeah, probably, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, like, uh, another thing that had come up in classes is, is that, like, uh, the authenticity of um, a country artist or a, or a Christian artist, uh, like these musicians that um, you know put forth this persona of being hey i'm this uh country guy who drives a truck and wears my boots and i love beer and stuff and i'm a good god-fearing man and then uh whenever he steps backstage from the country concert you know is like i'm gonna go home and i don't know have a new york accent yeah or so, yeah just any, anything or like you know, and as soon as that's discovered, like, you don't like that artist anymore. We, we really value authenticity. And, mm -hmm. and then even extending into, like, social media that, like, yeah, we, we put a persona of ourselves. But, like, um, it is very curated. And you're, you're also, like, I acknowledge that I'm not being authentic mm -hmm. whenever I uh, make a Facebook post or whenever I tweet because it's, uh, it's again, the version of myself that I would like people to see. Right. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like authentically, is that really me? I hope so. <laughs> uh, because in a way I'm, I'm marketing my authenticity. Yeah. Uh, through this podcast and through, uh, all other forms of media that I put out, like, I'm not a persona. I'm not selling anything yet. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so like what I am trying to give people is authenticity. <laughs> right. And, and that's what a lot of people are faced with, with this kind of like popularization of the internet and social media is like, how much am I Nathan Kent, Facebook, Instagram artists, whatever. Yeah. And how much am I Nathan Kent, the guy who sits on the couch and like 
watches TV. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, how much of, like, is this me at my best? Or is that a me that I aspire to be? Or is that, like, this, like, Facebook side of myself is what I'm talking about? But Yeah. Or not that I'm even really that active on Facebook, but... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think... But that's what I was kind of talking about in the previous podcast about how, like, Lucian Freud and, and Francis Bacon, like, you, they just exuded this kind of, like, genuineness. Like, mm -hmm. I make art, my whole life is about art. Like, yeah. I might be a dick, but, you know, <laughs> I make art, you know. I'm a painter, and you kind of respect that quality in somebody and that kind of, like, realness, and you know that... Like, they're so, like, weird and, like, <laughs> I don't know, like, so devoted that, like, you know that that's, they don't have time to be anything else. <laughs> like, there's no way they would have, like, a double life or anything yeah. because their whole life is in that, so. But with this kind of, like, selling yourself as, as kind of this cultural capital and like if you're like a country music star and like your thing is that you ride a truck and sing songs about your dog and drinking beer or whatever like and you aren't that like the only thing you might as well just have a different name mm -hmm. you know like yeah it could be like keith urban on stage and like john smith and the rest of your life and people wouldn't yeah. care but if you're keith urban on stage and then keith urban and the rest of your life and they're two different people then mm -hmm. it's, it's like stephen colbert or something yeah like, like he was like this totally like different like republican crazy person mm -hmm. on his like tv show <laughs> and but you realize that in his real life he's like progressive and mm -hmm. whatever so it's just kind of like it gets complicated because well, it, even then, uh, whenever you start considering, like, people who are an act. Yeah, uh, like a Like Stephen the... Colbert or Larry the Cable Guy. Um, that should we respect that they are an act and, like, continue appreciating the farther they go in this act? Or should we, like, because there are people that don't like it, that mm -hmm. they're like how can you be this person on stage and then not be that because you represent all the things that I like. Right. <laughs> but it's almost like so obvious because he's so much like so much of an archetype that it's like obvious that he's mm -hmm. making fun of it. Not to so, some people. <laughs> but to me anyway. Yeah. And so like it's easy for you, for, for me to appreciate, like, oh, like, it's a joke, it's a yeah, parody, yeah. like, it's satire, but, like, if you really, like, try to draw a line in the sand of, like, how much, like, when do you start respecting the act for an act, and when mm. do you, like, when is the act some kind of, yeah. like, you're fooling me, you're mm -hmm. trying to lie to me, like, I don't know. Oh, I think the the other part that really goes into the, the authenticity thing is whenever it starts dealing with money, is oh, that yeah. um, so? Like, let's say um, your art gets really famous or something, and like it's like, oh man, I really respect like what you're saying here. I'll, I'll buy this art for millions of dollars or something. And then what if at some point it just comes out and you're like. You know, I, I actually didn't really know much of what I was doing. I was just kind of making it and kind of saying that, like, I think people, I think the people who appreciate this stuff would buy it. And so that's why I did mm. it. You know, uh, that would be like a giant hit towards like what you're selling because, well, I thought that you were saying yeah. these things and <laughs> yeah, in the art world though, it's so complicated. Like, there's artists that, like, legitimately, like, do that, and everybody knows it, but people appreciate it because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, like, Damien Hirst, for instance, is an artist that makes a ton of money for doing what he's doing, um, to the point where he's a businessman instead of an artist, and mm -hmm. he's not really even making anything in large part because a lot of, like, the paintings he made in his early career, like people would paint it for him and he wouldn't even like, 
Mm -hmm. He would say, like, paint this photograph for me. And, like, a painter would paint a photograph mm -hmm. for an hourly wage or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't even take the photograph. Yeah. So, like... But the fact that, like, he wrote his name on it and made mm -hmm. money off of it, it gets complicated because, like, is is the idea the idea or is it the orchestration? Like, yeah, like, Beethoven wasn't the dude that was, you know, playing the violin in mm -hmm. the orchestra. Yeah. But he was the guy that wrote the music that mm -hmm. the dude is playing, so, like... <laughs> Who's making the music here? Is the music in the performance, or yeah. is it in the idea of the performance? Mm -hmm. or, um, so, and I mean, uh, I, we have sort of dived into that in school. Uh, that like, since music is this sort of impermanent thing, like mm -hmm. you can you can look at a score, but it doesn't make music. Right, it's, it's not music. It, is it music too? Like because like you have music on a page, but it, it doesn't do anything it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't even say anything it's just stuff on a page yeah. and like so the music is the sound over time that happens or is the music on the page actually music mm -hmm. um straight outside of that concept because that, that's a whole rabbit hole on its own um i think that to an extent that people value authenticity regarding money is because um, people ap appreciate the, the honesty. Um, mm -hmm. so whenever like Banksy, uh, mm -hmm. was doing graffiti, like truly graffiti, um, and sort of doing this social commentary, like he was truly anonymous, wasn't yeah. interested in making money. So yeah. people were interested in it because he was doing it. Yeah, but now his work is worth a lot of money. Oh, yeah, yeah. So now whenever Banksy does something, is is it for the money or is it because he's still doing social commentary? It's really hard to say. I mean, you could argue that nobody could be genuine after becoming, after having made it and being rich. Mm -hmm. the, like, you could argue that even if he was doing it for the right reasons, he would still be changed by even the idea of getting recognized. Mm -hmm. But, like, in his case, like, it's it's a complicated one. Like, he formed this kind of, like, company. Uh, I forget what the company is called, but it's basically just, like, a bunch of dudes that, like, authenticate, like, his paintings that, it's, like, if somebody's trying to sell it, like, they have to come and look at it and say if mm -hmm. it's a real Banksy yeah. or not. Like, this idea <laughs> of, like, did he really make this painting on a wall somewhere? And, uh... So, yeah, Banksy, like, he gets money for it, but, like, he's not really participating in the business side of it. Yeah. Like, he basically, like, delegated that to other people so that he could still do what he loves to do in a lot of ways. Yeah. So it's complicated. Like, does that make him, like, a more authentic artist than some other, like, street artist? Yeah. Maybe, but <laughs> maybe not. I don't know. Because... Um, cause even whenever you said like form this company, like already his street cred went way down in my yeah, head, no, totally. you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like, oh man, like, yeah, I represent, you know, rebellion and, uh, social commentary and stuff. But as soon as you put the word company into it, mm -hmm. it's like, ah, geez, there's no true. Um, and that's, like, the same thing with, like, any other, like, activist group, um, anything that... Yeah. Because I get email alerts from 350.org, um, and it's like, hey, this happened. You should be worried about it. These executive orders about pipelines are, like, you should probably worry about that. And then... But it's also, like, click here to donate, which mm -hmm. is just, like, oh, man. Because, <laughs> like... I appreciate that they have concerns and probably genuine concerns about the environment, but also the fact that they are asking for money is also suspect. <laughs> yeah. Especially not knowing what happens to that money. There's always a kind of like, it's almost like a paranoia, but it's really just kind of like a skepticism of like, mm -hmm. 
there's things that I don't that you're not showing me, so I don't trust what's happening. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, is there a way to be fully transparent so that your authenticity stays intact? I, I guess <laughs> not. I don't know. Like, then you're starting to get into like the limits of like even language. Is there a way that we can express ourselves how we truly feel 100 percent of the time? Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah. is that even possible? <laughs> like, I don't know, but I, I do think that like striving for authenticity is is a noble goal, and uh, I I do value it, and I think that like you bringing up the fact that like money kind of like emphasizes like the importance of authenticity to certain people, or uh, I guess like makes people more aware of people's faults or or lapses in authenticity. I guess. It's interesting because, like, money is like a currency doesn't really have value. Mm-hmm. So, in a lot of ways, it's all, like, this runaround game of, like, what we choose to believe and what we choose to yeah. tell ourselves. And, uh, yeah, it's it gets complicated. Yeah. Because then even regarding, like, Hillary Clinton, um, and that that's that's why, like, voting in this election... I can't vote. Voting in this election... <laughs> was so difficult for people uh, regarding Hillary Clinton because while she at least claimed to stand for, like, progressive views, so, like, progressive people would have considered voting for Hillary Clinton, but her authenticity is suspect given that she is a large part, uh, like, contributed by... Uh, banks and corporations and so it's like Mm -hmm. should we should we accept that should (laughs) yeah Yeah. totally but the same thing could be said for the other side in a lot of ways like Trump wouldn't show his tax returns Mm -hmm. and he still doesn't and like a lot of people think that, that voted for him because they believe him to be authentic because he would say off the wall vulgar things yeah and you're like if you're gonna say this then you must mean what you say but yeah from the same coin there's all of these like hidden deals and hidden agendas and i mean it might be getting giving them too much credit but Ooh. like i don't think i don't think he's as stupid as we think he is but i don't think he's that smart either. Yeah, I can accept that. Um, because to to suggest that he's a hundred percent authentic is um, not true because there's there's just so much money involved. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it should be suspect that he signed orders for pipelines. Yeah. It should be suspect mm-hmm. that he still has um, stock interests in his companies totally. in certain things. And for me personally, I believe that for him to prove his authenticity to me, as little as that matters, <laughs> he should have liquidated all of his assets. Like yeah. All of them. Mm-hmm. Like in, in reference to his company and stuff. But, I mean, him not doing that, like, I believe that he has some, like, weird... And mm. still some investment in this company that he's making laws to support. And exactly. I don't agree with that. But I think that other people, like, as much as it, like, is weird to say, like, authenticity is relative. Like, yeah, yeah. people's view of authentic and people's, like, acceptance of, like, how much, how much authentic is enough. Like, mm-hmm. that changes from person to person. Yeah. So. But even to the extent that, like... I mean, we started this conversation talking about religion and that, like, (laughs) if you truly believe um, that if you believe in Jesus that you're going to heaven, authenticity literally weighs on your afterlife. Mm -hmm. Um, That if you inauthentically believe in Jesus, then... You're actually God will be able to tell. He knows. Yeah. yeah. God knows. Yeah. <laughs> I guess is what they. So like, <laughs> maybe that maybe that is where it comes from. Why we value so much 
authenticity is that like, um, like God can tell how authentic you are. And so like, if you're not as devoted as you're supposed to be, then, you know, God will smite you down. Um, Mm -hmm. so I mean, like, that might be why we pursue authenticity so much, uh, as like an American society based on yeah, yeah. Protestant. That's just a hypothesis, but like, you know, it a lot of it could stem from that, like, you know, how how honest are you about yourself? How honest are you about your God? And so like a lot of what I challenge is, you know, keeping that authenticity consistent. <laughs> yeah. Um in that, uh, again, if you're going to say that killing is bad in one sense and not in the other, mm-hmm. then uh, you're being a hypocrite and inauthentic. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean... And it's hard to argue with that logic without <laughs> just saying... Because the Bible tells me to do it. Yeah, yeah. But actually, like, a lot of people don't even read that. <laughs> because my pastor tells me that it's the way that it is, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, because, like, I grew up Christian, too. I was raised Catholic. You can see the crosses in places around my room. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but the... The thing is that, like, so there's this big disconnect between, um, and sort of big argument, uh, in religion regarding, um, if you're saved by belief or if you're saved by works, um, and, uh, on the Catholic side of the spectrum says, well, you have to do these things. You should be doing these things in order to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. And on the more uh, Protestant side, it says, um, well, no, you just have to believe. It doesn't matter what you do. Like, you're already saved. Um, Like, if you're really saved, you'll do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, if you're really saved, you'll do it anyway. That already, like, so you should be doing it? (laughs) Yeah. Sorry to, like, veer all the way into religion again, but, like, the... (laughs) Um... Going into... Like, even our relationship... Relationships with people that, like, you are expected to be authentic um, with your wife. I'm expected to be authentic with my girlfriend. Um... Well, there's kind of this responsibility to be authentic, authentically, like consistently, um, because they love the person that you are as you are the person that you choose to try to be and to be. But if you decide to make, like, if you just all of a sudden, like, make a bunch of, like, totally different decisions and, Mm -hmm. like, like, they won't really know who you are anymore. Yeah. And you won't even know who you are anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so you almost have a responsibility to yourself to kind of maintain sanity, to choose to be the mm-hmm. way that you are authentically, like, um, to remain consistent in a certain way. But does that justify, like, certain feelings that promote hate or something like that? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I disagree with yeah. that. So there's... I guess there's that kind of, like, paradox of, like, I need to be myself out of a responsibility to myself, (laughs) but what am I? And, like, what does that mean for me going forward? Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, you should probably have these conversations with yourself by going, like, okay, well, if I'm honest with myself, uh, I hate black people or whatever. And it's Uh like, well, should I hate black people? do I like the fact that I hate black people? And so even being more authentic to yourself, should you be like, maybe I shouldn't hate black people because I don't like me hating black people. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Uh, for example, 
Um, but even kind of what you were saying earlier that um, the persona that we put in Facebook or something, um, like if there was a way for you to be 100% authentic and 100% honest all the time, uh, even the barriers of language and stuff that like, what are you actually able to honestly represent to your significant other? Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) I mean, to a certain degree, like how much are you even aware, like even without language, like just feeling like how much of your feelings can you like if you really like try to like distill it all down to like what you actually feel and your like core self and your core beliefs, like how much of yourself is so fleeting that you can even like pinpoint it down to be honest with yourself completely, mm-hmm. to be a hundred percent authentic to your own, to somebody that you are with literally like every waking moment, like yeah. yourself, like, <laughs> like, there's so many like variables and things too. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's just kind of like the way the direction that my mind works and that my brain goes is just, and a lot of what like, my art is about is like how there's just so many variables, like everything is so uncertain and everything is so like to like assume that you know anything or to take anything for granted or to like know anything for certain is absurd. Like mm-hmm. that whole idea is yeah, yeah. Like, impossible Mm. so even like the attempt of like trying to fool yourself is like what kemu called the absurd Mm. is fooling yourself into believing that you know anything that you know what you're talking about that you know (laughs) and so much of being human is like coming to terms with that even if you're not aware of that inner dialogue to like choose to be as authentic as you can and to choose to be positive at moving forward instead of like fatalist and nihilistic mm-hmm. and just giving up yeah I, it's kind of like a tangent from <laughs> well but. no i think that it's perfectly good because this this conversation doesn't have to go anywhere but <laughs> <laughs> um but i mean the do we accept that absurdity because because like you could become fully nihilistic and go, yeah, it doesn't matter whether or not I know myself (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, because, because I can't. Um, So screw it. (laughs) But, um, but I think that like when you have those thoughts and everybody has those thoughts regardless of their belief, Mm -hmm. like, questioning like what's the point in something or Mm -hmm. something else and like and that goes back to like the cynicism thing of like whenever you have those thoughts like are those productive thoughts does that take you in a place where you want to go and Mm -hmm. you start thinking well maybe i don't want to go in that place like maybe i just want to give up so if your end goal is to like give up then Mm -hmm. keep thinking those thoughts but if your end goal (laughs) is to like move forward in a direction to achieve some kind of a goal and that goal is like being a better artist Mm -hmm. or being happy or making friends or having a family or whatever Mm -hmm. like it's important to like pursue the thoughts um they kind of put you in the direction of where you want to end up yeah um yeah and that's honestly why like it, how you're saying that if you want to keep going, then you should probably put your thoughts in a better place. Then, uh, that's honestly why I'm so optimistic, like mm-hmm. almost to a fault. Like my, my second thing is it's going to be okay. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> uh, because you, you really have no choice. Like, because if it's not going to be okay, then sure you'll die. Like, yeah. um, and that's like the worst. Well, not even because you could just suffer infinitely forever. Yeah, like that'd be that's the worst. redundant. But <laughs> like, you don't want that. It's not in your best interest mm-hmm. 
to make things worse. What you decide is your best interest. Yeah. As a sovereign human being. Sure. Who's responsible for making his own decisions on life. Yeah. Be them ethical or moral. Or... <laughs> I... Um, so on this other podcast I listen to, uh, Dr. Chris Ryan uh, keeps... Uh, he's kind of that age where... Um, he keeps telling the same story over and over again. Yeah. You know, those people that, like, maybe you've had a teacher in school or something that if you, like, get them on the right tangent, they'll just say the same story again. You don't have to do any homework. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, so, um, uh, Chris Ryan is, um, he, he's a really cool dude, but uh, he keeps telling uh, the story about whenever he was younger, he... Um, tried to get this job as a like suicide hotline mm. uh like basically trying uh to keep people from killing themselves um but whenever he was doing the job interview he like did pretty all right during the whole thing except um at one point uh they asked can you think of a situation where someone killing themselves would be a good thing and he was like yeah lots of times <laughs> like I don't think we can have you for this job <laughs> um and so like I can justify that there are probably situations in which killing yourself might be a solution those are very scarce and before arriving at that conclusion, you should probably... Once you've exhausted all Yeah, you options. should exhaust yeah. all options because there's no going back from that decision, yeah. literally. Um, so, like, yeah, I can think of some situations, uh, but it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Like, you were probably not in that situation. <laughs> yeah. If you if it's a question for you, then you're probably not there yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, given that option, still like, yeah. If that's a question for you, then you're probably not there yet. Then at that point, you should just consider just radical optimism, mm. <laughs> just really stupid optimism. <laughs> It uh, at least makes it a lot more easier to take life in general. Yeah. Like, just makes it a lot more enjoyable experience. And so if for no other reason, you might as well just enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> like, people can, like, be cynical and logic loop you into, like, being pessimistic all mm -hmm. that they want, but at the end of the day... And they like, do it to themselves, too. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like, if, if you want to be happy and that's what makes you happy, then you should keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, because, like, it, it really just doesn't help you to be negative. It doesn't help you at all. Mm -hmm. Like, so... It's been my experience, having lived... Um, a life having lived years of pessimism in contrast of my more recent years of optimism I mm -hmm. definitely think that I have a lot better things happening <laughs> going on and yeah. that I'm attracting a lot better relationships and a lot better um, just opportunities in general mm -hmm. I think I've success has come a lot easier to me with that mindset than with a cynical mindset or a paranoid mm -hmm. mindset or a yeah, yeah. depressed mindset. And I honestly think that like more people are, are more optimistic than they think. Mm -hmm. Like, cause even though they say like, and it's kind of, uh, I have a friend who, who constantly like gets into these like depressive fits, you know, and he, he texts me randomly like, Oh, what's the point of anything? And I'm like, okay, but do you want, like, he's like, ah, oh, everything sucks, and, like, what's the point of me doing anything? It's like, well, do you want stuff to suck? Does sucking suck? <laughs> he's like, yeah, and I'm like, so don't, 
don't do that. <laughs> don't put yourself in that yeah. spiral. Yeah. So, like, everyone is more optimistic than they think because everyone knows that sucking sucks. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> so, e even kind of looping back into authenticity that, like, if you're kind of more honest with yourself probably more more optimistic than you think you are because you don't like stuff sucking either <laughs> right yeah um because i mean yeah if you're honest with yourself then you probably wouldn't enjoy uh stabbing yourself in the hand with a spoon repeatedly uh because that i'd just rather not do that yeah. uh and if you can go up upwards from there, you're you're probably going places. <laughs> um, I always enjoy making things as ridiculous as possible because it it, it allows uh, points to come across a lot easier. Um, because rather than uh, making a really dull example, uh, more ridiculous thought experiments are more memorable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think um, there's just one webcomic Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoons. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're really good. I'd recommend it. It's like really, really smart humor. Um, but he, he kind of said that like in one of his comics is like a good teaching tip is make examples really ridiculous. Either really ridiculous or really morbid. Um, because, uh, it stays in people's heads better. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I mean, I, I've considered teaching for, for some time. And so I, I feel like I would utilize that quite a bit. <laughs> um, your art sort of utilizes a sort of that absurdity. Um, to what extent, um, is that? optimistic do you think um i think it's always i think absurdity is always optimistic in that it's always ridiculous rather yeah. than morbid yeah and i think that just coming across in um it just has like a sense of humor to it um but in a way that's Maybe unconventional. Yeah. Um, yeah, like in my sculptures, I use a lot of unconventional materials, like hair nets and just random shit mm -hmm. that a lot of people like s shy away from because it's not fine art or it's not archival <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I think like elevating hair nets to like a fine art standard is pretty ridiculous. But it also makes it really cool. <laughs> that, like... That, that's something else that, like... Um, makes uh, some of the stuff that I do at school um, really interesting and really fun. And the fact that I get to go, like, this is what I did at school today. Um, is that... Um, for one assignment... Uh, we were basically told to sample something, like get a recording of something. And then through Ableton Live, the program I was using earlier, uh, you're able to put samples in there and like make such a small like sample, like just a grain of it to just basically make an oscillator um, to be able to make notes out of anything. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, one of my friends who uh, wasn't in class that day, but um, asked about like, hey, what's the assignment? I'll, and I explained that to him. He goes, cool. And then later he messages me and he says, I'm sampling farts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's good to be able to sample farts or use uh -huh. hair nets in <laughs> In fine art. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, I mean, do you think that 
laughter is a correct, or not even correct, but just an appropriate response to to your art. Yeah. <laughs> so, I I don't really laugh at my art, but I I just, there's a certain personality I guess that goes into it, and certain sides of myself that do certain things, and certain sides of myself that don't do certain things. I guess so. I guess the analytical side of myself is what's making art, and mm -hmm. I can appreciate like people taking it in like a kind of comical way and I think that I definitely like insert some of that in there and this kind mm -hmm. of like critique of contemporary art and this kind of like being utterly like um unimpactful in some ways and just yeah. like really anticlimactic like I was mentioning like yeah the joke that takes itself too seriously I think that it's kind of like an anti-joke, you know? Yeah. And, like, you don't always laugh at anti-jokes, but you get them, and some people don't appreciate them, and that's yeah. fine. But. Same with puns. I make a lot of puns. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think that um, it's good to acknowledge the the absurdity of what you're doing as well. Do you laugh whenever you're making some of the stuff? No, not really. <laughs> Because, I mean, because if you're acknowledging the absurdity of something, I think that um, in one of your Instagram posts, you were, like, saying, like, oh, what could this be? Is it a... <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the sphincter or the nightmare maw or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, like, I appreciate that because... To an extent, yeah, you're like, hey, this is art, and, like, you're supposed to get something out of it, but at the same time, it's like, this looks like a sphincter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually have, it's like, since I make work about, like, non-forms, and since I draw in, like, sustained gesture, like, shapes come out and stuff, so I have this, like, little sketchbook that's full of just, like... Oh, that I'd never show anybody, but it's just like weird faces and turtles and mm -hmm. I don't know, like dogs with yeah. giant erect penises and whatever it comes out. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like this. Like, oh, that kind of looks like a turtle. I'll draw that real quick, and then I'll like cover it up because yeah. I gotta finish this drawing. And I was just like a part of it. So, do you put like, do you put forms in your non-form? Mm -hmm. No, because, like... The you do it intentionally to be non-form. Yeah, <laughs> so it would kind of be, like, inauthentic in a lot of ways sure. to, like, leave little clues because I'm so, like... A lot of it is in, in response, like, against, like, as a critique of some of those, like, more traditional, like, mm -hmm. symbolic things of, like, I hid this skull in here to remind people of death or whatever. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's all, like, bullshit. yeah. Um, can fine art, like, so a lot of stuff has intent, mm -hmm. um, and that sort of goes in line with authenticity. Um, well, what's some of the, like, most interesting intent that you've seen in some art that you really appreciate? Hmm. Well, there's always this kind of, like, two-edged sword of, like, the audience interpretation and the artist's intent. Mm -hmm. So, basically, like, the artist, like, makes something and with the intention of it coming across a certain way and whatever the audience decides it is is what it actually is. Mm -hmm. you know? Once the artist finishes it and gives it, gives it up to be in the public realm, mm -hmm. then... The artist doesn't really have much say in, yeah, in yeah. what goes on. So intent is kind of like useless in some ways because it's it's good to have intent because you have to like make you're trying to make communications, you're trying to make connections mm -hmm. with people, and you're trying to like inspire thoughts or actions in some cases or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And um, if somebody like 
if your intent is to like, well, when I want somebody to see this, I want them to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then the audience comes and like 20 people see it and they're like, this makes me want to throw up. Yeah. Then you're obviously like, your intent is, you're not doing what you want to do. Yeah. So you got to like change your method up to like make it more in vain of what you want to do. And that's what critique is all about is like making your intent match making you such a good communicator that whenever you say something, mm-hmm. people see that. Yeah. And, um, so I guess like specific examples, it's kind of like hard to come by because it's always like an afterthought in some way, because as an artist, you kind of look at art from the realm of like, uh, of the audience. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think that uh, whenever I make music, sometimes, like, it it has a lot of emotional intent. Mm -hmm. Um, And so a lot of that might, like, in the same way that you're saying that, like, critique um, influences how well your intent is coming across. Um, And to an extent... Uh, because I'm trying to wrap this up, uh, <laughs> um, that the, the better that we get at, uh, communicating our intent, the better we get at being authentic. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Uh, one is like an extension of the other for sure. I think, Especially, like, as a maker and somebody whose intention is is to create something with the purpose of communicating a a message. Like, people, the audience, which is, like, everyone else on the planet, like, sees what you're saying and sees what else you're saying, like, through your lifestyle and your choices and sees what you're saying through your eating habits or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, like, in a sense, like, everybody that observes anyone else's kind of trying to formulate some like idea yeah. of, of who they are and whether or not they're and someone who's inauthentic is somebody who doesn't make sense. Yeah. That doesn't really bode well with humans. Mm. They like things to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Um I feel like we need to end it there. Um but I do have to ask one question that I forgot to ask in the last one, which is, what advice do you have for people? I don't really give advice. (laughs) I don't know. I try not to think that I know more or less than anybody else. It's just different perspectives. So I guess just empathy, just acknowledging other people's perspectives is good. (laughs) I will accept that as an answer for advice. (laughs) Uh, once again, where can we find your stuff? Uh, I have an Instagram. It's called Nathan underscore M underscore Kent, K-E-N-T. And you can find some of the art that we talked about just now on there. Um, which is really interesting and is better represented, uh, as opposed to an audio podcast. So, (laughs) uh, Nathan, thank you. Um, I see that your wife is eager to get in contact with you, which is why I'm trying so quickly to wrap this up. <laughs> oh, you're good. <laughs> um, I'm Santiago Ramones, and you can find the stuff that I do on my website, SantiagoRamones.com, uh, which is where you will find some of my music, including this podcast, uh, which you can support by contacting me and reviewing on iTunes. I was in every podcast.